Thank you for coming out on a Monday night. Um, it's actually quite like, I think it's more people than we expected, which is pretty good. Um, we, I'd like to thank the Science Gallery for, for hosting this and to Accenture the doc for sponsoring this talk. And um, I, I think this has been a long time coming. I think there's been a meetup group that's been around for a couple years. Uh, I just moved here from Toronto and I was like, Connor, we gotta get this started. And so um, this is the first inaugural Designing Human AI Interaction Meetup Talk. And the first of what we hope is many. And we're gonna be doing a series that we're calling Designed Intelligence. Um, these are talks that explore tools, methods, technologies, and ideologies that are shaping uh, human AI collaboration and interaction. And, um, and on that note, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna get right to it. I'm gonna invite Connor Upton up here. And Connor is the Group Design Director at Fjord Dublin. Um, it's situated win within Accenture's global innovation hub, The Doc, who sponsored this talk. Um, as Group Design Director, he's responsible for design craft across the organization, um, leading the evolution of design practices to embrace data, algorithms, and systems thinking. Connor applies human-centric approaches to the design of complex work environments and has published and spoken widely on this topic. Um, his projects cover multiple domains, including public safety, manufacturing, sustainability, and he's interested in how interactive visualizations can support collaboration between humans and AI. So welcome, Connor, to the stage. <laughs> Hope I don't disappoint now. Um, yeah, so thanks again for coming out. Um, as Rob said, we're based down in the dock, which is Accenture's global innovation hub. Um, looks like this. Uh, it's an interesting place to work as a designer. We're a team of about 45 designers that sit alongside similarly sized teams of data scientists, software engineers, and we operate underneath the banner of pioneering conscientious innovation. So looking not just at the technical aspects, but also what are the human and societal impacts of, of some of the um, innovations that are happening. So we're a place where we work a lot on projects, pretty much all of our projects touch on artificial intelligence to some degree or another. But we're also a venue for clients to come in and bring in some of their strategic problems and to see how design, innovation, and technology can help them tackle them. So we're kind of a venue for clients to come in. And over the last year or two, we've had a lot of clients who've come in who are curious about AI, who are sometimes concerned about AI. But more often than not, they're actually very confused about what AI is. Um, and it's not surprising that they're confused because the term nowadays is kind of synonymous with, with technology. It, it's, it's kind of everywhere, the hype cycle is really big, and it leads to confusing things like this flower dog, which James, one of our designers, was playing around with. I think it was Gan Breeder he used. It's a, it's a nice, nice piece. Um, and what's confusing about AI? Well, part of what's confusing is it's in our lives already. I mean, it's everywhere. This isn't robots, this isn't Terminator. We're all interacting with AI every day. Um, it's on our phones, categorizing our friends. It's allowing us navigate the world even when we're unfamiliar with it. Most of us are experiencing it because it's telling us what we should watch or what we should listen to. And while there is AI in all of these, it's deeply embedded in products and services. So deeply embedded that, that most people don't even think that it's AI. And this was predicted by John McCarthy, one of the pioneers of AI. He said, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. And I think in this case, he's, he's right, but that's confusing for people. You know, it's just an app. The other thing that's confusing is artificial intelligence, you know, its early uses were in the areas of categorization of big data or prediction of future trends based on large volumes of past performance data. But AI itself is evolving all the time and it keeps evolving. Um, I don't know if people have seen this. This is a, a tool from Autodesk who makes computer-aided design tools. It's called Dreamcatcher. And this is what they call a parametric design uh, product. I'm hoping this is gonna play, yeah. So in this case, what designers who are making a product do is they set the parameters of the thing they want to design. You know, the strength, the amount of material they want to use. And then different forms of the product are generated by the AI automatically. In this case, it's the chassis of a motorbike. And you can see they can look at, see all of these different versions of what the thing may look like. And then they can 
play around with the vectors to choose what's the best solution. So this is, this is confusing because this is, this is, you know, relative to the other things pretty, pretty far out there. And AI is also confusing because more and more we're starting to see its unintended consequences. Um, when we see AI applied to web scale platforms and AI deployed at speed, at scale, we're starting to see some issues. Um, and this includes things like gender bias. I mean, there are, have been a litany of examples of that. Most recently, the Apple Pay card that gives higher credit ratings to men than women. Um, we've seen it with uh, racial biases in a range of different examples, again, most recently in terms of healthcare access in the US. We've seen other issues, things like complacency, where people become over-dependent on AI. And there's a long history of this in critical systems domains, but most recently, again, we've probably seen this in the rise of autonomous vehicle crashes, where the human thinks the AI is just gonna look after everything and then, and then stuff happens. And we're starting to see it in some really, really s strange, weird places. Places I think we didn't think it would go, uh, which leads to things like this. very strange. Um, what you're looking at here, uh, has anyone got kids in the audience? Yeah, okay. I have a four-year-old who I've given in like many parents and let him watch a bit of YouTube when he's freaking out, wanna watch some YouTube. Um, but I've, I've stopped that basically because I read an article by James Bridled who's a researcher and artist who was, uh, he wrote an article called There's Something Wrong With The Internet. And on it he identified how um, bot-generated content and comments were targeting the ad revenue around kids' YouTube and, and kids' nursery rhymes. So they use common nursery rhyme tropes and famous characters to try and game the recommender engine so that this would come up in the auto feed. And this is just weird. Um, there's loads of, thousands of versions of these. These have started to be culled now. But actually a lot of it had very, you know, unsavory content, violent sexual references, stuff that you wouldn't want to show to children. So this is confusing. You know, I think Kevin Kelly summed it up well in his book, The Inevitable. He was talking more broadly about technology, but he said, said in it, we're morphing so fast that our ability to invent new things outpaces the rate we can civilize them. And I think this kind of triggers a lot of the concerns that we see today about AI. And where is this bringing us? It's bringing us to the strange place where organizations who largely are building and in control of artificial intelligence are, are diverging their views from, from the general population, from people in general. So organizations are accelerating their use and adoption of AI, <coughs> while at the same time, the general public, workers, consumers, are starting to grow wary of its potential effects on their lives, and they're certainly becoming a lot more aware. So this is an interesting point in time, and you know we've been doing some research into this and reflecting on it. We've, we've, we've seen that when you design for artificial intelligence, it actually also means designing for human intelligence, designing for the intelligence that, that builds and controls it, designs for the intelligence that has to use it day in, day out, and designing for the intelligence that gets affected by it. And that sounds like a lofty goal. Within the program, we're trying to look at how we can unlock the full potential of, of both human and artificial intelligence in a way that's more symbiotic, in a way that they can collaborate together. This is a broad program of work. Um, we're looking across different areas, like informing strategy, like in, informing how systems operate, and also looking at how we can enhance the human experience by giving people capabilities that they didn't have otherwise. And we have a range of different tools and activities we do around this, but in this talk, I just want to step into one, which is called, uh, we're calling it the AI Creative Matrix. Um, can I just get a show of hands? Who here would identify as a designer of some description? Okay, yeah, and as a technologist? Okay, all right, so yeah, largely a 50-50 split, I think. So let, let's dive into this. So we've already said how AI is quite confusing, in the midst of all this confusion, how, how should we even start to think about it? How should we come up with solutions that can use it in a way that, that is more resilient, more flexible? This is a challenge we face a lot as designers when we're told to look at tech pro problems, but also for clients who come in. And the difficulty is 
the barrier to entry around the term AI is actually quite high. Like I said, we sit with a lot of data scientists, with a lot of experts. I think typically when you ask a deep expert what is artificial intelligence, more often than not they kind of go, well, you're using that AI term. When they want to get into the details of it, they probably give you some of the technical terms around it. So quite soon you hear about neural net, you hear about random forests, you hear about all of these accurate descriptions of the models that drive AI. But certainly for a lot of our clients and for most people who aren't experts, it's very difficult to associate those with the lived experience or the problems that you're trying to solve around. So what we've been doing and what we've found helpful is to actually reframe the technology in more human relatable terms. So we don't talk about computer vision, we talk about seeing, we don't talk about natural language processing, we talk about reading. We talk about hearing, touch, recommendation, creation. And by reframing the technology in these terms, you actually democratize the ability to ideate around it. People can start to see how these terms could be brought into support some of the, some of the activities that they're facing. And we've built a, a, an exercise with this that we run with client workshops where we essentially use design thinking methods to get them down to what is the core problem they're trying to solve, so a how might we statement. Then we quickly bring them through micro lectures around what these technologies are, industry examples, and we give them like three minutes to ideate how this technology could help solve their problem. And very quickly, you can get everybody from our CEO level down to somebody who's working at the coal face to actually come up with ideas in the context of the, of the work they're doing. So I'm going to use this as a way of explaining how we use it, but also to show you some of the work we're doing at the dock. So let's uh, jump right in. Um, sorry, at the dock and broader across the Fjord network and the Accenture network. So when we talk about seeing, computer vision is probably one of the most you know, widely known forms of AI that's out there. Um, and computer vision has gotten incredibly powerful. Um, a number of years ago, Fjord published a trend where we talked about taking things off the thinking list, so how technology can help us in our already very busy lives. And when you think about it, we're already carrying around these extra eyes in our pockets, so the cameras that are sitting on our phones are all around us. So our studio in Austin was looking at how we could use this to improve a consumer experience um, working with a, a large retailer in the US. I'm just gonna play a short video here. So this is computer vision with augmented reality with recommendation engines all interweaved into a product that can make the consumer experience better. So it's interesting in consumer experience, but when you look towards more expert systems, I think this is where it can get really interesting. Because AI can allow us not just make our lives easier, but also go beyond our own capabilities, seeing things that are imperceptible. This is actually some research that came from MIT a couple of years ago that I, I just think is really amazing. This, this baby here in the picture, I don't know, you probably can't see it, but that baby's breathing. It's, it's hard to actually see that at the moment. But what the researchers did was they found a way to detect very slight variation within that video feed and then feed that back to re-enhance the video so that it can be detected with the human eye. So that's pretty impressive. There's another example of it here where they did the same with heartbeat. And while this allows you as a human to observe these types of, you know, these types of signals off the body, it also provides another way to gain those signals. So if you think of an immunocompromised um, individual, like this allows you to you know, start to move away from body-worn sensors into, and the impact that that might have for those patients, or even the patient experience, um, I think is pretty, pretty impressive. So if we go beyond to another sense then, what about reading? So it's, as humans, we read to learn about the world, to get the opinions of others, to try and understand other people's views. And that's great, but there's limitations to our capacity to read. It's a, it's a, it's a ser serial process. You can only read one book at a time. Um, what if we had to understand a huge amount of text or vast opinions from many, many different people? You're probably all familiar with NLP and how it's been used for things like sentiment analysis and social media. Um, we've actually been using it within our design practice to help us augment our user research. There's a project that we did recently with a large insurance company who wanted to understand um, their customers' behavior, their customers' lives, because they wanted to move beyond classic insurance products which is essentially a premium that you renew once a year, into more digital health services. So how can we support people managing their health, particularly things like chronic care? 
Now, what was interesting is they're a data-driven company. They're an insurance agency. They have loads of data. But most of their data describes customers in terms of risk, the risk that they carry, not in terms of their pain points, their lived experience. So they asked us to do some research, but they wanted us to cover a lot of people and in a relatively short period of time. So I want to just play another video here that shows an example of how we went about it. We interviewed 200 senior care providers. We analyzed their responses using natural language processing and generated bi-gram networks that surfaced the key important themes. For example, when asked, how could your caregiver learning experience be improved? We can see that carers need support and that they want classes, but they have little time for them, so they need better options for learning. These visualizations provided a reference for discussion with our client around the true user needs. So again, this, the idea here is not to automate the user research process, but using technologies to allow us enhance the scale at which we can carry it out. So what about hearing? Again, this is another sense, and probably one that people don't really think about when they think about AI. But more and more, we've got conversational agents within our lives, within our homes, when we pick up the phone and, and ask for a service. And again, we think about this a lot in customer care services, but what if we had to push this out into its extremes? Uh, we worked with a large uh, policing organization to, I was probably not coming up super clear there, to look at um, how we could augment their emergency dispatch. So emergency dispatch is, an, is, is a challenging, it's, it's challenging work. You have a lot of agents who, you know, people dial 911, 999, um, and they're talking to someone about a stressful situation. At the same time, those people who pick up the phone, many of them are not touch typists. They could be police who are off beat. They could be, you know, citizen police officers um, or support staff. But they have to fill in a very complex form very, very quickly. Speed is really essential. You want to get the services out as quickly as possible. Um, but you also have a job of keeping the person calm, keeping them on online, um, keeping them safe. So they asked us how we might be able to help solve for that. And we, again, I'll just play this video so you can get a sense. This emergency. Hello, there was an assault in the street. There's a man down. He was attacked by two persons on a motorbike. Can you tell me where this has happened? Uh, I'm in Green Street. I think he's been stabbed. Please confirm the man is in Green Street. Do you believe he's been stabbed? Yes, yes, the man is in Green Street and, and I think uh, they tried to rob him and he's been stabbed. I'll get officers on route to you. Can you give me more details? What's your name? So, again, what you see here is the ability to use the technology to accelerate a process, to augment a process, to improve the data quality but not to replace the work, because you're never going to do that. You need to have that human-to-human -human relation in that stressful environment. So moving on to another sense, what about touch? A lot of the time when people hear AI, they think about robots. Robots are not AI, but AI is changing the nature of robotics. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a whole new generation of robots, these cobots, um, that have been used in factory settings, in other settings as well. Robots have been used in heavy industry for years, but typically it's used to do highly dangerous tasks, like spray painting cars or lifting up chassis. But the robots themselves are dangerous. People were traditionally kept away from them. The new range of, of cobots that are out there are flexible. They're, um, you, don't, you can actually train them through physical manipulation. So moving the arm around, getting them to do something, and then say, do that a thousand times. It can go and do it. And that flexibility, um, the, makes them a lot more adaptable. You can do a lot more different tasks with them. We've been playing around with uh, cobots at the dock. Um, this is something we did for, uh, um, for a large innovation show uh, where we were racing individuals against individuals paired with a robot where they had to build a robot. It was a little bit, yeah, in inception. But, um, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a really fun experience for people where we could actually outsource some of the precision manual tasks to the person uh, while still allowing them to deal with the cognitive tasks. And recommend. So again, as people, we love to recommend. We love to predict. We like to think we know people and we can see what their habits are and give them good advice. Um, and a lot of us will have encountered recommendation engines, again, through media platforms, things like Netflix, things like Spotify. Um, but IoT and the ability to put sensors everywhere opens up the space for where we can recommend and how we recommend. There's another project we've been running uh, under the code name The Last Mile. Um, and what we've been looking at here is 
essentially the challenges that postal services face. So the postal service model is, is kind of, it's, it's in a serious state of decline. When you think about a postal service, it was built in the Victorian era around the idea of putting a letter through the letterbox of your permanent abode once a day. But that loses relevance in a world where people expect fast, flexible parcel delivery to wherever they are. But these services, typically semi-state or state-run, come with, you know, they have a lot of workforce already in there. They have big infrastructure investments. How can we, how can we help them to, um, to pivot, to, to kind of try and deal with challenges that are emerging from same-day delivery services? So we looked at things like uh, demand prediction, like how we could optimize routes around the city to try and allow them move from a, uh, that static model to a continuous collection and delivery model. And some of the interfaces you're seeing here, these are really, really critical. These are the interfaces, in this case, for, some, for, the, um, uh, for the dispatcher in the command center. But we also have interfaces, mobile interfaces, for the delivery agents. Because these are people with years of experience, and they have access to data that the optimization engine doesn't. So if they hit a scenario out in the world, how does that information get back? So we've provided the ability for them to set these dynamic constraints out in the field based on their lived experience out in the field and get the AI to do the heavy lifting. And this is really important. By keeping it collaborative, we can help, um, help ensure its adoption by existing workforces. And finally, create. We talked about Dreamcatcher earlier on, and uh, we have, we're so lucky to have Jean here tonight, who's really kind of you know, in terms of computational creativity and generative art, he's, he's really at, at the forefront of this. Um, many of you will probably have heard about generative adversarial networks or, you know, their use in deep fakes, but it, it goes way beyond this. This is a project from Microsoft Research. This bird over here doesn't exist in the real world. This bird was drawn by an AI based on the command for draw me a yellow bird with a black, black wings and a short beak, and this is what it produced, which you know, I think if you're not an ornithologist, this is, this is pretty good. It's, it's better than I would draw anyway. Um, so Gene will show a lot more work in this type of space. We've been playing around with it in other areas. Um, we have clients in food production, and uh, one of them came in looking to see how can we actually use AI to help us come up with new products, new flavors, new flavor combinations. Um, so the team at, uh, in technology labs or Accenture labs uh, came up with a, a knowledge graph that allowed them to recommend these unusual yet um, delightful combinations of flavor. And then we set up a little test kitchen and started to try and build out some of this stuff. So it's combining the, the computational power of the algorithm with some of the creativity of the people that we work with, um, including some of the folks in the kitchen who produced these very nice AI-inspired tapas. Uh, which we then fed to clients as part of a workshop on, on artificial intelligence. The one in the middle there is a, a bitter chocolate boule on a Parmesan crisp. So it's kind of like a chocolate taco. Um, and you'll have to take my word for it, but it was pretty good. So, like I said, we use this framing to try and democratize the process of how we think about artificial intelligence how we can actually allow everybody to say, okay, well, I, I have an opinion on this and I know the problem space, so I should be able to um, give my opinion and actually start to see how we can solve problems. And we think this is really important because when you show clients the power of the technology, a lot of people move straight to this idea of, oh, well, I have human eyes who look at this thing, but now technology can do it, so I can cut down my workforce and this is fine. There's this big jump around automation that people instantly go to. But the reality is AI, machine learning, tends to automate tasks, not jobs. Jobs, by and large, are messy. They're a lot more complex than people usually say they are. Um, and this idea of being able to swap out an AI for an entire workforce, I think, has been challenged, and certainly as we look at it over longer periods of time. So we're looking to try and move people from this automation mindset that focuses on workforce replacement to designing work more as a, a living system. So thinking about, okay, this work exists to do a certain process or a certain task, but actually there's feedback loops in there. We've got points where people interact with the data or the product. We've got points where we might be able to put in um, AI or machine learning or robotics 
But we have to understand what happens when we put that technology in. What does it do to the rest of the system? What kind of knock-on effects can it have? And this is where we've be really been focusing in on systems design as a new capability that we're, we're developing. So, like I said, this is one module within a much broader uh, set of work that we're doing. And as part of the, the series that we want to run on this, that we're running on this, um, we'll touch into some of these other points, things like how we design collaborative AI, how we take a systems thinking approach to designing solutions in this space. If you're still interested and you want to find out more on this, uh, there's a, the good news is that the barrier to entry for exploring AI in a more creative way has dropped really significantly over the last decade. So there's a range of websites, resources. Feel free to grab a pick of that if you want it. Um, Elements of AI is a really good onboarding. Uh, algorithms of design, uh, phenomenal to see how the design industry is being changed. Um, Google runs a lot of experiments, and I, I, some of these are absolutely mind-blowing. Um, Distill.pub, great articles in there and building blocks. Um, Fjord, we publish under Medium under a, a channel called Design Voices, and also The Doc actually has a Medium channel as well, where we publish uh, all of our work. Um, and also, uh, Gene has his website, and Gene, we've been fortunate to have Gene with us for the day doing a workshop with us. Um, I strongly recommend you explore um, some of the work he's been doing here. It's, it's, really, it's really great stuff. So, yeah, uh, we feel this is important for designers, and for technologists to start to talk about these issues together. Um, again, just to leave you with a final Kevin Kelly quote. Uh, in his book, he states, this isn't a race against the, ma the machines. This is a race with the machines. And I think it requires multiple disciplines to come together. And hopefully, we can build amazing stuff like this guy who built a robot that feeds him tomatoes while he's running. I don't know why he did it, but, um, but uh, he's kind of a hero of mine. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thanks. So we'll do a Q&A session at the end, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Gene to you. So Gene is an artist, a teacher, a programmer. He explores autonomous systems, collective intelligence, generative art, and computer science. So he's interested in advancing scientific literacy through creativity and play and building educational spaces which are as open and as accessible as possible. And again, Gene will point you to some of the stuff he's published and his work. All right, so hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, and uh, it's really nice to be here. As I was telling these guys earlier at the workshop, this is my first time here in Dublin in 11 years, and I was just here once, um, really short visit, so it's really nice to be back. So I'm going to just kind of dive into my work. It's like going to try to make this a short talk, and I have like way more slides than I really need to, and so I'm just going to blast you with stuff. Um, so let's see how it goes. Um, I'll tell you really quickly about myself. I have this fantastic. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, I have, this, I have a background in music and machine learning, so that's kind of how I got my start. I um, originally was working with a uh, sort of mad scientist friend of mine who was developing musical instruments and trying to create systems for uh, you, these musical instruments. They don't make any sound. It's just a controller that has a bunch of sensors on it. And then we try to create digital, in, digital synthesis instruments, and virtual instruments, and then control them with this, you know, this sort of flute-looking flute -looking thing. And um, the only way to really do that properly, sort of mapping sensor parameters to uh, digital synthesizers to use machine learning. You let, a, you let a musician kind of train the instrument to play in the, in the way that they want it to be played. So, you know, the, the, the trainer is holding it in a certain way, and if it's held this way, they want it to make this sound. And if it's held that way, they want it to make that sound. And then machine learning is used to kind of fill in the gap between all of this uh, relationship between the inputs and the outputs, and then you get a uh, working uh, synthesizer. And so this kind of got me on the path towards creative AI, because it's a sort of dry academic question, you know, sort of how to create um, mappings from sensors to digital instruments. But of course, it has this sort of creative element to it. And um, that got me interested more and more in the 
creative sides of, of machine learning. And lots of people were asking questions like, can we use this for real-time music production? Can we use it for um, you know, creating interesting digital tools? You know, Ableton Live, is an, if for th those of you who are musicians, you might know Ableton Live uses a lot of this kind of you know, scientific libraries to automatically figure out how many beats per minute your audio is or figure out how uh, what the chords are and things like that that help you as a musician. Um, let's skip that. So I um, so this kind of got I, I started working a li little bit more in the visual domain and one of the things that I became interested in is this technique in in deep learning, which is kind of the ascendant form of machine learning today, which uh, visual which tries to visualize what's going on inside of neural networks. And neural networks are these machine learning algorithms which detect patterns in data. And they detect patterns in this sort of compositional, almost hierarchical way. So patterns on top of patterns on top of patterns. And the question is, what patterns are they, are they visualizing? Because they do so much of it autom automatically. And so there's research into this that goes back 10 years, trying to synthesize images which maximally activate a particular part of a neural network. So let's say you have a neural network that is optimized to detect bell peppers. Well, then the question is, what is the perfect image for this neural network so as to make the bell pepper neuron go crazy? And so it's something like this, right? And of course, originally this, this uh, work was purely academic in nature because it was just interested in creating tools for, vi for uh, scientists to visualize data. But, um, but years, a few years later, it started to look prettier. <laughs> so um, this is kind of uh, going back to 2015, a, uh, the, uh, the release of a uh, package called Deep Dream or Inceptionism, which was uh, a technique for doing this exact same kind of visualization process, but uh, in such a way that produced much in more interesting pictures. So this is what a, the optimal banana looks like and the optimal starfish, right? And uh, the researchers went even farther with this. They, they started making art, right? Because the idea is that this is a process that optimizes the pixels of an image towards some objective. And the objective in the case of the bell pepper was to maximize the bell pepper neuron, right? But then wh what if you instead turn the process around and say, okay, instead of telling it what objective I want it to have, instead I'll put in a real image and then look at all of the activations of the neural network and then make them all go higher. Try to make the neural network go crazy for everything that it thinks it sees. So it's literally hallucinating, making the neural network hallucinate. And you can feed in images of pure noise and it'll find something. It'll find some pattern in the noise and then keep on enhancing that pattern until you get these kinds of vivid, vivid uh, looking images. So this is the original researchers work, uh, Alex Mordvinsev, Mike Taika, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I got really interested in this technique. I'm gonna show you some work I've done in this space. So I started making these um, kind of, so like as an artist, I, I'm really interested in getting more levers of artistic control because you know, machine learning kind of takes them away from you. AI is kind of doing everything by itself, right? And so how can we get back some of those controls, you know, for, for doing composition, right? And the idea here is that you can maximize multiple objectives at the same time and combine them with masks. So these masks are kind of uh, sort of telling the neural network, I wanna enhance this pattern over here and I wanna enhance that pattern over there. And then the, what, what, what the most interesting aspect of this is that in places where you're kind of blending them or transitioning them, you see that the network hallucinates these patterns that kind of maximize both neurons at the same time. And so you get these transitional patterns that you see at the middle here. And using this approach, you can create images like this. So this is two neurons, again, kind of linearly interpolating between the both of them. And you see in the middle, there's, you know, it looks a little bit like both. Like there's this kind of gets the extremes of both pattern into a sort of mellow transitional zone, let's call it. And then um, you, can you can arrange the masks in circles, as you see here, or you can do all sorts of interesting things. You can create videos. And so because there's always an input image to this process, and so if you want to make video, you just make one image and then use that as the input to the next image and use that output as the input to the next image, and you do this in a sort of feedback approach. And maybe you even distort the canvas as you do it, maybe rotating it or zooming in or something like that, and you get all sorts of 
you know, interesting looking shapes. So these are just some highlights of it. Here's using masks from um, actual images. So this is an eye. And then, you know, you just kind of segment the eye and then use each of the regions as masks and for different neurons. And they, they tend to blend really nicely. Um, and so I really enjoy that approach. So a little while ago, I was uh, angry at Twitter, you know, as, as we all tend to be because, but I was angry for different reasons. Most people are angry for some, some current events or something. And I was like, I don't like this 15 megabyte rule for, for videos. I want my videos to look longer. And so I figured out a way to actually create infinite loops of these deep dream uh, rotations. So here, if, you're, if you've noticed, or you probably have noticed, but this is, this is actually a six second long video and it just loops. These are actually, uh, it's actually three seconds long. I think the video is six seconds long, but the loops are three seconds long. And so it looks like it's, it looks like it's expanding outward, but it's actually never going anywhere. It's kind of like a shepherd tone a little bit. If anyone's familiar with this auditory illusion called the shepherd tone, really interesting thing. Um, don't want to go in too much detail about that, but yeah, infinite loops saves the day. So um, more infinite loops. This is so these are texture synthesis. Uh, this is texture synthesis an approach to taking some random image and synthesizing it, uh, synthesizing images that look like you know look like the texture of that image. So this is using the Great Wave of Kanagawa as the as the source texture. It's a famous painting um, from Japan, and taking. Uh, Kandinsky, again, this is three seconds long. It's just going in an infinite loop. And then this right here is Google Maps. And, um, you know, it's kind of like if you've ever had a dream and you're looking at your phone and you're zooming into your Google Maps and it just never, never terminates, this is what that would look like, I think. Um, more of these loops, so you can, you can compose with them in various ways, right? So the, the, the point is that with these approaches, you know, there's less magic now. You know, it's not just neural network make me a crazy image, it's that I can actually kind of control it a little bit. I can say, okay, I want these patterns to go in this direction, and I want these patterns to distort in this way, and so on. And also using masks of other images, so I'm sure you recognize the, the person on the left. Um, maybe not the person on the right, though. I'll give, I'll, I'll give, <laughs> I don't want to bet to, I'll give five dollars to anyone who knows who that is. Yeah. All right, I owe you five bucks. Um, I'll come. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was gonna say like a hundred bucks, and then, I, and then I realized like, no, this is a bad bet. <laughs> and then, Yanlikun, correct. Um, okay, so um, style transfer, same thing as texture synthesis, except you have sort of you apply it to a particular content image, and um, so this is the Mona Lisa in the style of Van Gogh. Hokusai and Google Maps, my favorite source texture of all time. And you see that it's, it's re remarkably accurate. You know, you really see the, the patterns in, in great detail. And so you see all those little Google markers everywhere. Um, yeah, so this is an installation I made called Cubist Mirror. And it's exactly what it sounds like, or at least it was. Um, the first version of this was just a mirror that would turn you into a Cubist painting. Uh, now it's actually not just cubist paintings, it's, it's all these other styles. Um, but basically you get in front of the mirror and you see yourself in this iconic painting style. Kids really love it. And so I'm available for weddings and bar mitzvahs and, <laughs> and um, events, so please let me know. Um, and uh, okay, let's talk about generative models. So this is where things get really trippy. Generative models are probably one of the most exciting areas in the world of deep learning. It's the kind of thing we weren't really able to do uh, in, this, in this way up until maybe three years ago. And it's just getting crazy. So we can make hyper-realistic looking, I mean, maybe these aren't super realistic, but, but you know, pretty impressive, uh, looking images that look like they came from, you know, data sets of cats or cars or, you know, TV screens and things like that. And these are, um, these are increasingly becoming realistic. And so even a few years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do anything like this. And uh, I've been really interested in generative models as a person interested in generative art. Um, generative models, of course, being you know, probably the most powerful generative algorithms that we have. And so um, there's kind of two categories of them. This is my workshop mode coming out, my, my teacher mode coming out. I'm not gonna labor the autoencoders and GANs, but if anyone's been keeping track of the field, Generative adversarial networks and GANs, they kind of take all the press, um, all, the, all the sort of um, exciting press, but 
Uh, there's actually a, a lot more to it, and GANs are pretty, really, really amazing and interesting. And uh, yeah, we don't have time to get into the details, but I'll just show you some cool things that I've done with them. The original authors, I, I always love to credit the people who made this stuff work because they don't, no, they don't show up in the press anymore. You know, everyone's like, I made an AI do this, this, and that, and it's like, these, no, <laughs> these guys did. Um, so um, this paper first showed the application of, um, uh, of GANs to making images that looked super realistic, like faces, and, and actually this doesn't even impress people anymore. This, in 2015, we thought this was mind-blowing. You know, but, but now it's actually kind of small and weird looking, and now it's gotten a lot better, the state of the art, but in 2015, this was crazy. And they showed that you could do arithmetic on the features. So you could basically do this kind of uh, cutting and copying and editing different features at will. So you could be like, okay, I want, I want to take the smile off this person. You know, so I find the smile vector, and I subtract the smile vector, and then I produce you know, an image of a person without a smile. Or here, I, I, I find the gender vector. So I subtract man plus woman, and then I make this man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. So you could do this kind of uh, neat arithmetic tricks on the, on the generative space. And my first project with this, I was, um, try, it, was, it was shortly after the first software for this came out, I was uh, working with this data set of handwritten Chinese characters. And I basically applied a DC GAN to these, generating fictitious kind of, well, fake versions of real characters, let's say. Um, and this was a project called The Book from the Sky. It was uh, named after um, the work of a Chinese artist named Xu Bing who had been fabricating actually fake, like fictitious characters um, out of wood blocks for a long time. He actually lives in New York City. And, um, and so this kind of shows you the latent space of Chinese handwriting. And you know, people have, just like, uh, just like with us, we, we kind of write in different ways. And you know, there you can see that some people have blocky letters and some people have, you know, write their loops differently. And so this kind of lets you visualize that process. And you can do, even do interpolations between different characters. And so this is kind of interpolations between uh, sets of related characters and with, with nice transitions between them. And my, in my sort of half-baked imagination, the way I think of this is um, Chinese writing is pictograph pictographic. So you, know, you have a, a, a sign for different characters, right? Or for different words um, or different concepts, right? And you can think, for me, like, you know, why isn't there a word between people and culture? You know, maybe there's like a concept between people and culture and no one ever bothered to assign a character to it. You know, so this is, we have this whole sort of continuous fabric of possible words and then the points that we actually have characters for, you know, th those, are, those are there, but then this is kind of lets you model that whole space so that you can, you can kind of, not my fault, I don't think. <laughs> um, so, Anyhow, um, same thing, but, but this is actually holding the, uh, so Chinese characters are divided into 214 radicals, and radicals are these sort of base root characters, which, um, and, and the characters that belong to a particular radical, they all have this related history, and so you can actually uh, hold, in some of these interpolations, the, ra the radical is preserved. Um, it doesn't break up, even though it changes form in different characters over the centuries, it's kind of, lost its shape in various ways. Um, it doesn't always work, but I cherry-picked some examples that do. And then this one is kind of a joke because we have this, um, you know, the whole arithmetic on features thing. So you, and, and the, the, the one that we always use in word vectors is this kind of like, if you, uh, if you do king minus male plus female, you should get queen. Um, now this is not the character for queen. It doesn't, it doesn't actually make any sense, but, but it's kind of a, this is a joke that only scientists would laugh at, so <laughs> I should really get it, get it out of my slide. Um, okay, so um, these GANs, they have gone from literally being 32 pixels in two, uh, five years ago to life-sized. You know, like it's 1,024 pixels. This is not a real person. It's a totally fake face. And um, all of these faces are fake. So it's, it's just crazy where we're going with this. And I think by 2020, I think we're just going to have like totally giant-sized GANs all over the place. And they're becoming more and more realistic. So this is some work from DeepMind making fake dogs and mushrooms. This is one model that produces all of these. So it's really, it's really, really like incredibly, you know, uh, incredibly realistic and, and trained on many things, not just faces, but trained on many things. Artists love GANs. You know, there's lots and lots of different artists who are exploring these. 
Uh, many of them are, actually all of these are my friends now, which is really great. We've kind of found each other through the internet. And um, there's been just like uh, lots of, yeah, lots of, actually uh, not this person because I don't know who it is. This is anonymous. Someone made some generative ramen on Reddit. So, <laughs> but the other people are, are good friends of mine. Okay, so um, here's another GAN on trained on 100,000 paintings from WikiArt. So this is, I downloaded 100,000 paintings from WikiArt. This is kind of the last big one that I trained. And it makes fake paintings. They look like, you know, historical sort of paintings, abstracts and landscapes and, you know, all of the, all of these different kind of features that you might expect to see in, in, uh, in classical paintings. And um, yeah, everything else just kind of gets, gets to be more and more like, like my talk is gonna become more and more sort of um, nonsensical as we go. <laughs> so um, this is a, this is, so I showed the hyper-realistic dogs and everything that was a big, that's a, a GAN called Big GAN. And um, Big GAN was trained by DeepMind and they released it online so you could do all sorts of things with it. So I thought I would have some fun with it. And one thing you can do is to try to mix different classes together. So you go, okay, I wanna generate a dog, or I wanna generate an owl, or maybe I wanna generate both a dog and an owl at the same time. And so that's what this looks like. This is basically the owl dog. And this is another owl dog, right? And it looks like a character from Harry Potter, right? Like this should be in Harry Potter. It's just like the wise owl, I think something like that. This is cool because it's an owl plus a cat and it looks like a snow leopard. It's kind of a snow leopard looking thing. This is a mop dog of some kind. Um, a crown, this is a, it, now it's just, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's basically an owl plus a crown or a, th a throne, yeah. Um, this is a dog plus a sea lion, it's really adorable. So I just kind of thought I'd leave it in there. This is my favorite. So this is an, yeah. So this is an orca, like a, a whale and a tram, and it looks like a, a fairy, right, when you combine them, it makes total sense. Uh, oh, what's this missing? Oh yeah, so this, okay, so here's the, the, what's going on here. Um, so I'll, I downloaded a video from uh, Planet Earth, you know the show Planet Earth? And so this is some sequence from Planet Earth, and from every frame, I did a prediction of what the image has. Like the, the you could do, you could classify an image into into a probability over all the different things that's in the data set. And then you take that probability and you feed that to Big Gan. So you basically get the Big Gan to try to regenerate the movie. And so whenever it sees birds, it generates birds. Whenever it sees penguins, it generates penguins, and so on. Um, and so. I had limited success with this, but it kind of worked really well with animals. So the planet Earth was, was the kind of one experiment that worked really nicely at this. Now this is, a ca there's a category of generative models that translate one image to another. So you can generate, you can train, for example, a neural network to take an image of a place in the daytime and convert it into the same place at night, right? And th this doesn't look that good, but this is kind of actually a few years old. It's gotten a lot better. This was just the original paper for doing this. Uh, train it to do edges to, the, to photographs, train uh, black and white images to color, and so on. And so one of my first projects in this, this is actually the first project in the space, I think, was a collaborative project during a workshop of mine with, actually, with, with students, where we basically downloaded map tiles from different cities, and then, uh, and then trained these models to convert the map into the satellite image of the same place. So then, so, so then you can do this kind of city style transfer. You can take the map tile of one city and run it through the generative model of another city. And the end result of that is that we could take a, a satellite image of Milan and change it into a satellite image of Los Angeles. You know, so this is kind of Milan in the style of Los Angeles or Milan in the style of Venice. And you can see that all of the, all of the roads have become like canals in Venice. That was kind of the most, the inter most interesting find. The state of the art of this has also improved a lot. So this is actually, these are some highlights from NVIDIA who released uh, this, this work uh, last year that shows, again, converting these, these sort of label maps into realistic looking fo like fo photographs basically. And so it was really kind of really interesting work. And also doing things like synthesizing dancers 
all just you know really really crazy work on Nvidia. And using this technique, I actually I made an installation which is up running now in Berlin. So if anybody happens to find themselves in Berlin some any time in the next uh, two years, uh, you can go to a museum, a really new museum, awesome new museum called Futurium, the Future Museum. It's it's like in central Berlin, and it's free admission. So if anyone's there anytime, go check it out. Uh, you'll see this. This is basically an installation that lets you draw landscape photographs. So you know, you put some rocks over here, some mountains over here, some trees, some clouds, and so on, and you get sort of realistic looking, um, you know, landscape photography. It's very similar to some work by NVIDIA. I basically recreated it, and, um, but, but kind of for the masses, let's say. Um, and um, rule number one, you put a cute baby in the photograph and everyone loves it. You know, so uh, this, is, this is some highlights of another installation in the same place. You, uh, this is a playpen where you have these plastic pieces which represent buildings, parks, and water. And as you move them around the playpen, there's a camera tracking them and doing kind of the same thing as, you sh as I showed in the Invisible Cities project, um, generating landscape photography, uh, so, sorry, generating satellite imagery of uh, looks like Berlin. And so this is kind of a generative model trained in Berlin. Um, this is a work that I did with a colleague of mine, Andreas Refsgard where we, oh, here I do have sound, I forgot. Um, <laughs> maybe I should skip this if I don't have sound. I'll just tell you about it. Maybe you'll be able to hear it actually from my laptop, why not? Let's just give it a shot. Oh, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> all right, well, all right. I'll, all right, so basically the idea here is you draw musical, you draw uh, instruments on paper and it creates music depending on the instruments that you draw. So let's, let's give it a shot. Can you hear that? Oh, well, okay. Is that okay? Draws a little piano, put a saxophone, some drums in there. and roll, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, like I said, this talk is just devolving from here. Um, <laughs> so uh, so when, when this picks to pick stuff started happening, we realized we could, we could impersonate, ma we could create masks of people, right? So you could, you could do, uh, you could extract the landmarks of a face and then generate a, a, a generative model that will convert the landmarks into a particular face. And so I did this for the president, our president, um, in 2016. And, um, and you know, this was kind of like, a, and, and th this is 2016, this is my hacky version of this in 2016. 2017, still a little hacky, but starting to look better. 2018, here's NVIDIA generating synthetic faces, obviously not of the president. Um, and, <laughs> and you can see that the state of the art of this just keeps on improving. And I like to think that my job as an artist sometimes is to warn people about the future, because you know, this kind of stuff is just gonna be all over the place. So um, this is, uh, this is a, my favorite generative model. It basically lets me cr do sort of operations on, you could project a real image into the generative model and then do operations on it. So here, this is me. Uh, and then this is me with blonde hair, glasses, and heavy, heavy makeup. This is, yeah, I look like a 1980s hair rock sort of pop star. Um, this is me, yeah, just like doing all of these operations, kind of having fun. I like to make myself the joke, the butt of my own jokes. Um, this is me being turned into a certain Canadian pop star. <laughs> who knows who that is? Uh, this one I'm not gonna make a bet on. Uh, it's definitely not a good idea. This is me being turned into various heads of state. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is this is also a practical joke. So how many people know FaceApp? You seen FaceApp? Yeah. So FaceApp, like 
you know, makes you old and young and, or, 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 and then it puts a smile on your face. So this is not my smile. This is like definitely not what my smile looks like. Um, and so the, 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 I thought it would be funny or interesting, let's say, to try to run face app like over and over and over. So basically like you put a smile on your face and then, and then you take this picture and then you ask face app to put a smile on this face. And then you take that picture and then ask it for it to put a smile on that face. And you just do this over and over and over. So if anyone's interested in knowing what that looks like, I'll save you the trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, and at that point, it, it actually stops and it can't, because it can't recognize the face anymore. And so you can't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's this repository called Deep Painterly Harmonization, which lets you sort of like superimpose one image into another. It's kind of like style transfer. And so I just started like throwing myself into various, you know, paintings, like hanging out, like, hey, um, this is super creepy, right? It's like, <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, yeah, throwing myself. <laughs> okay, enough of that. No. Okay, now uh, I have. I, I'm I'm going a little long, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a moment to describe a new project of mine that is like my my live stream. This is this is my ten year sort of. Uh, this this one's gonna take a long time because it's not really practical right now. So this I have this idea to make an autonomous artificial artist. So what I mean by that is. It's, so, so over the last few decades, many artists have tried to create agents that they call um, AI artists. You know, so, so like uh, one notable one is Harold Cohen who made, an art, who made a project called Aaron and he uh, basically made this, this, um, this sort of robot that draws paintings and he, and, and he would always encode all of his own, he would program Aaron to make art kind of like him. So, um, and many people have made these things that they call, this is an AI that's making art. But I've always found them a little bit unsatisfying because it felt to me like Aaron was really just Harold Cohen and it was Harold Cohen programming a robot. So I thought like, is there some way I can create a true autonomous artist? An artist that's not me, an artist that is separate and independent and sovereign and has its own creativity and so on. And so, and, and I, and, and I think we can do this now. And it's combining multiple kind of layers of technology that, uh, and, and also multiple layers of collaboration to, to actually achieve this. And I don't have enough time to really explain in great detail, but, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about my, my sort of crackpot idea to, to make this work. So the idea to make an autonomous artist would involve creating a generative art program, which is a separate agent whose behavior is controlled by a network, a decentralized network of collaborators. And uh, the artist would have to make unique and original art. It has to be original in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't copy from any of us. It doesn't copy from any of the people who make it. And it's unique in the sense that nobody, nobody actually has control of the artist. It's kind of like a shared secret. A shared secret is this cryptographic term for something that all of us have together, but none of us have individually. So basically like we all have like a piece of a, of a, I don't know, like a Da Vinci code secret type thing. We all have like a piece of the secret and your piece by itself is useless, but <clears throat> all together we, we, we have this artist. And I, I associate this with autonomy because it's basically, it's, it's autonomy emerges from the collective, right? And, and we can get into the philosophy of this, but I don't have enough time. Um, but basically, the, that's the that's the general idea, and so how do we actually achieve this? And I, I kind of looked at nature for inspiration, right? I think we see examples of of uh, autonomy emerging in nature. So, for example, uh, the the best uh, not not dunes dunes is a, a different analogy. <laughs> the best example is hives, right? So we have this term a hive mind, right? And the, what is a hive mind? It's the apparent mind or presence of a collection of bees, or you know, if applied to some other kind of collection, which apparently emerges from the collective but doesn't apparently exist anywhere, right? It's kind of this abstraction on top of all of these unique individual minds. And so I think that, that this is sort of, um, that collective intelligence is a separate intelligence, right? It's kind of a unique autonomous intelligence. And so I'm, I, I, and so this is kind of, how I think we could build it. And I think it works really well with deep learning because 
in with machine learning, you have a neural network which is um, which is very very large and homogeneous and can be easily split up. And we actually already split up neural networks. We when we split them up into different GPUs, into different graphics cards, and all the processing recombines. And so I have this idea to basically make a a peer-to-peer -peer network which splits a huge neural network whose job is to make art. And each of the pieces of the network hold a pe uh, each of the uh, like participants hold a piece of the neural network and then the neural network produces art. And so someone, if someone wants to get a piece of art from this network, they send a query to the network and then the whole signal, this would make more sense if you knew how neural networks work a little bit, which, which so, so in, in my workshop that makes more sense, but um, the whole signal propagates through this network and then output, outputs an image which goes back to the collector. And so because this graph is sort of decentralized, no one has enough to reconstruct the entire image. It has to actually pass through the entire network. And so you can enforce sort of like uh, arbitrary scarcity on it. You can enforce all sorts of uh, decentralization constraints on it. So maybe all of the training data has to come from multiple people. And so basically the, the whole thing becomes irreproducible. So the, this, only this graph can produce this artwork. Um, only this network can produce this artwork and there's no other way to do it. And so from this, I associate it with, with autonomy, like an, uh, like an autonomous spirit that's making its own art. And I, w I know it's really half, you know, crackpot, half-baked idea. If I had more time, I would elaborate on it. I actually have a talk online that, that talks about this for like a whole hour and a half. And so I encourage you to look at that if you're interested. But uh, the project is called Abraham, a little bit of an homage to Aaron and some other, uh, and some other things. But I, I, there's an article online that I've written. If you go to abraham.ai, you'll see more info about it. Um, the idea is, uh, is sort of a grand synthesis of four different fields, I think. So computer art and uh, AI, artificial intelligence, philosophy, like the philosophy of mind, like what is it it means to be a creative autonomous spirit, and, um, and, crypto and cryptography basically, cryptoeconomics, decentralization technology, putting all these things together. And there's various things that are already at the intersections of all these fields. And then this autonomous artificial artist is smack right in the middle of them. And so uh, the problem of course with the idea is that it doesn't, it doesn't um, it's totally impractical right now. It relies on a bunch of experimental technologies which aren't mature at all, do not scale. Um, but, but there's a lot of good reasons to believe that in the next five to 10 years, the uh, technologies that it relies on um, are going to be uh, are going to be much more mature, and they're becoming more mature because people demand them. So there, it overlaps a lot with, for example, decentralized AI, privacy-preserving AI, um, secure AI, and things like that. And so, um, yeah, we'll kind of see how that turns out in a few years. And it has a whole bunch of uh, in, like intellectual building blocks are, are super experimental computer science, a um, lot of lot of kind of very meaty space and a lot of stuff that I, I know barely anything about myself. And so I'm at the beginning of a long process of learning this stuff and trying to kind of, um, trying to convince people to, to join me in this, in this sort of process. And um, so yeah, that, that's all my work and I wanna mention a few things. I run a lot of workshops so we're here kind of running one, um, well, kind of. <laughs> we're running a workshop at, at Fjord, which has been great. This is the first day, we'll have another day tomorrow. Um, I've done something like 100 workshops in the last three years. It's been really, really awesome, really basically almost like a full-time job for me. And I put all of my materials for machine learning for artists online on this website, ml4a.github.io. Um, and so um, these are some of the resources, basically a lot of applications, a lot of uh, demos, real-time demos, a lot of sort of uh, instructional guides and so on. And um, and uh, the guides are over here. You can see that we have something like 30 guides that do various things. And, and, um, and I also record a lot of my lectures and I put them online. I teach at NYU. And so um, the last class that I did where I did a full, a whole th uh, basically recording of 12 weeks of lectures is online uh, on ML4A. And so that's basically like 30 hours of this. So if, you're, if, you, wanna, if, you, if you wanna hear that for 30 hours, yeah, go, go over there. And um, all, another thing is I'm an advisor to a new company called Runway. Runway is a, uh, basically trying to bring creative AI to the masses. It's basically like the Photoshop of, of creative AI. So trying to create an application that you download and you can run all of these open source algorithms that you can find on GitHub for doing interesting things with machine learning, you can run them locally. And so that's all. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I went a little over, I'm sorry about that, but, um, but thanks a lot, yeah.